Good evening. You're joining us here at New Covenant Presbyterian Church in Middletown on Wednesday evening, April 29th. This is our normal time for making a video worship service for the coming Sunday. We typically email out bulletins so that you might fully participate in these worship services. If you're not currently on our email mailing list, please give us a call at the church, 302-378-4446, or you can shoot me an email at pastornewcov at gmail.com, and we will include you. Today, we're focusing on the Gospel of John, chapter 10, where we hear of Jesus and the role of the Good Shepherd. Our Gospel lesson today ends with my favorite verse, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the kind of life that I believe God wants all of us to have, and I invite you to join in on our online services, and when we gather for our in-person worship services, we invite you to come and join us. Those who participate in our ministry here at New Covenant realize that we feel like family to one another, and we welcome one and all to join our family of faith. We're so blessed to have a good shepherd who cares for our every need. We know our shepherd's voice, and we willingly follow where he leads, because we know how much he loves us. Sheep learn that their shepherd cares enough about them to lead them where places where they can find food and water, and places where they can sleep and be safe. You'll see that I have a display on our communion table to help you identify with the role of the biblical shepherd. Our good shepherd does pretty much the same for us. Most of us have what we need, but there are some in our community who are hungry and in deep need. God wants us to reach out and help them. One of our members, Jane Adams, who is our liaison with Neighborhood House in Middletown, has been working to find a way to help provide food for those in need in our community. I just heard today that Neighborhood House will be open next Monday from 10 to 2 to distribute food to those in need. At this time, it is the only set time they are planning on being open. We are hoping that there will be additional times. Jane and I will help to distribute the food, but we need you to help by collecting non-perishable food items at the church. I will be at the church this Sunday from 12 till 2 p.m. and I encourage and invite you to bring whatever food items you can so that we might feed the hungry in our community. Also, the YMCA in Middletown is having a food distribution next Thursday, the 7th from 9 to 12, as long as their supplies last. We will keep you informed about other opportunities as we become aware of them. Jesus is our spiritual shepherd, but he calls us to shepherd those in need just as he did. And so, dear friends, please join us in collecting food so that many in our community will have their hunger met, both physically and spiritually. Truly, we want all of those in our community to experience the abundant life that Jesus offers. Thank you. And now we will move on to our worship service. Welcome to New Covenant Presbyterian Church's online Sunday worship service. This is the fourth Sunday after Easter, May 3rd, 2020. We want to welcome you all to this service. And now let us join in reading and preparing ourselves for worship. How is the worldly version of abundant living different from abundant life in Christ? Here is a story to consider, which is entitled, Life is Like a Cup of Coffee. A group of alumni, highly established in their careers, got together to visit their old university professor. Conversation soon turned into complaints about stress in work and life. Offering his guests coffee, the professor went to the kitchen and returned with a large pot of coffee and an assortment of cups, some porcelain, others plastic or glass, crystal, some plain looking, others expensive, some exquisite, inviting them to help themselves to the coffee. When all the students had a cup of coffee in hand, the professor said, if you noticed, all of the nice-looking, expensive cups have been chosen. 
leaving behind the plain and cheap ones. While it is normal for you to want only the best for yourselves, that is the source of your problems and stress. Be assured that the cup itself adds no quality to the coffee. In most cases, it is just more expensive, and in some cases, even hides what we drink. What all of you really wanted was coffee, not the cup, but you consciously went for the best cups. And then you began eyeing each other's cups. Now consider this, life is the coffee, the jobs, money, and positions in society, and the cups. They are just tools to hold and contain life, and the type of cup we have does not define nor change the quality of life we live. Sometimes, by concentrating only on the cup, we fail to enjoy the coffee. Savor the coffee, not the cups. The happiest people don't have the best of everything. They just make the best of everything. Live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly. And now join me in the call to worship. What a joy it is to be able to join together to form the body of Christ. We find, we find such, such encouragement from gathering together in the presence of our God. Remember what it felt like when we were able to actually come together in the same room to worship Almighty God? Yes, we realized that maybe we took those opportunities for granted, and yet we give thanks for having the opportunity to worship with our church family, though we may not be gathered in the same worship space. Let us remember that we are the people of God no matter where we worship. And we praise God for every opportunity we have to be part of the body of Christ. And now let's have a good time singing our hymn of praise, The King of Love My Shepherd Is.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you for all good and perfect things. We know that where we are, you are with us. And we are so glad that you've given us your Holy Spirit to comfort us and guide us, even as we are separated from each other. So we ask for your blessing today, Lord, that you open our hearts and minds to your word for us in the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first lesson is from Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47, Life Among Believers. So those who welcomed this message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This ends our first reading. Our second lesson today, as I mentioned before, comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Listen for the word of God. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. God. Our gospel text today puts forth this notion that Jesus wants us to have abundant lives. So we have to ask ourselves, do we really consider our lives to be abundant? Perhaps it would be helpful to consider the difference between what it means to be happy and living abundantly. I don't really think that abundant life in Christ is about being happy, but there are lots of people who are constantly Googling how to be happy. And believe it or not, if you do the same, you'll get more than 800,000 hits on this topic of interest. You can find all kinds of suggestions about how to be happy with yourself, how to be happy if you're single, how to be happy at work, and the list goes on and on. Christian writer C.S. Lewis wrote a book with one chapter which was entitled, We Have No Right to Happiness, in which he warns us that the good news is more than a promise that we'll be happy. In fact, no such promise is made, and the continual pursuit of happiness as an ultimate goal in life will often result in an unnatural affection for something that will end up hurting us. Lewis writes about the concept of this right to happiness. He says, As first, this sounds to me as odd as a right to good luck. For I believe, whatever one school of moralists may say, that we depend for a very great deal of our happiness or misery 
on circumstances outside of human control. A right to happiness does not, for me, make more, much more sense than assuming we have the right to be six feet tall, or to have a millionaire as your father, or to get good weather whenever you're just in the mood to have a picnic. So as we begin to ponder this concept of happiness and living abundantly, we might also reflect on how many of us are not living lives that we would describe as fulfilling. In increasing numbers, Americans seem to be spending the majority of their time working, which leaves something to be desired. Of course, in the midst of this pandemic in which we find ourselves, there are quite a few people that would do anything to have a paying job on which to spend their time. And I imagine that when they all get back to work, they will see it as a blessing, something for which to give thanks. But this is not the typical situation. A Gallup poll not too long ago revealed that 77% of American employees hate their jobs. Gallup also contends that this ailing workforce is costing employers more than $350 billion in lost productivity because Americans are increasingly unhappy in their employment. These figures intrigued an author by the name of Patrick Lencioni who became somewhat obsessed with this idea of job misery. So he set out to focus on this topic in his book, the three signs of a miserable job, as his attempt to meet the problem head on. Now you might be wondering what all of this has to do with our scripture for the day, and here's my rationale. I believe that if we take a look at what makes people feel miserable, then we can learn something about what it takes for us to lead abundant lives. You'd think that the barometer of job satisfaction would depend on things like salary, job responsibilities, and the possibility for advancement. And according to Lencioni, those aren't insignificant factors, but they are not the key values that determine whether or not you have a miserable job. For instance, a professional basketball player can be miserable in his job while the janitor cleaning out the locker room finds fulfillment in his work. Or, a marketing executive can be miserable making a quarter of a million dollars a year, while the waitress who serves him lunch derives meaning and satisfaction from her job. What makes the difference between a miserable job and a satisfying one? According to Lencioni, it's the relationships formed on the job, particularly the relationship between manager and employee that determine whether your job is a dream or a nightmare. He points to three critical signs that when put together, lead a person to misery. So I'll begin by sharing with you what those three signs are and then review them in reference to our John 10 text. So be prepared for those lists of three. Here's the first set. The most telling indicator of job misery is anonymity. People cannot be fulfilled in their work if they are not known, says Lencioni. People need to have a sense of being understood and appreciated for their unique personality and gifts, and that feedback needs to come from someone in a position of authority. If people feel invisible or anonymous in the workplace, particularly for their supervisor, they can't love their job no matter what it is or what it pays. We're not talking about the need for constant praise here, just a sense that someone in authority cares about the people in their charge. The second sign is irrelevance, or knowing that your job matters to someone, to anyone. What this means is that without an employee seeing a connection between his or her work and the satisfaction of another person or group of people who simply want to have lasting fulfillment, that's what makes the difference. A job must have some kind of purpose and impact on others, even if it's just flipping hamburgers. We all want to feel that what we do matters and that someone will miss us if we're gone. Lencioni invented the word M-measurement to describe the third sign. 
M measurement illuminates the fact that employees must need to be able to mark or understand the progress they're making, have some sense of measuring it. Employees don't want their jobs to be merely judged subjectively by the opinions of others, which can lead to politics and posturing in the workplace. They want to know how they measure up based on an agreed upon set of criteria. Measurements don't necessarily have to be numerical, but they do need to be tangible. Take a grocery store bagger, for example. How many bags he fills in an hour might be one measurement, but he might also measure how many times he enables a customer to smile, or the time it takes him for him to move customers through the line. Humans like to feel a healthy sense of competition, seeing it as an opportunity not only to measure performance, but to improve it. But what do these three indicators of job misery have to do with our gospel text? Let's see how Lencioni's book can help us unpack the meaning of our lesson for the day. These signs that Lencioni talks about all seem pretty elementary, that something that pretty much anybody who works with people would understand. It should be a given that leaders know their people well and care about them that they help them see how their place makes a difference and gives them markers to assess their progress. Unfortunately, it doesn't always seem to work that way. It's no wonder then that job misery more often than not spills over into other aspects of a person's life. Health problems, addictions, broken relationships at home, these all seem to be byproducts of a miserable job. We weren't created to work this way, or live this way for that matter. God created us to enjoy a fulfilling, life-giving relationship both with God and with one another. We were created to live with a purpose and to measure our lives not in terms of the dollars we earn or the amount of stuff we own or produce, but by the amount of love we give and receive. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. If there are markers for a miserable job and ostensibly a miserable life, Jesus offers a completely different set of signs to mark a life that can be fulfilling and fulfilled. As John 10 opens, Jesus is still engaged in a rather heated exchange with the Pharisees. The conversation sparked by Jesus' healing of the man born blind in the previous chapter. The Pharisees were acting like the ultimate bad boss, being ruthless rather than compassionate and joyful at the man's healing. Notice that the blind man is never named. He's anonymous. And the Pharisees seem to care less about the man himself than about the legality or illegality of the man being healed on the Sabbath. In response, Jesus draws on a different vocational metaphor to counter the legalism of the Pharisees. It would have been hard to imagine that a job was more miserable than being a first century shepherd. Besides the grinding boredom of moving sheep back and forth from water to pasture to the sheepfold, shepherds faced very long periods of time away from home and family. Living most of the time in the open, they were often pounded by very harsh weather. Their nomadic life meant that they could dine on only the most basic of foods. Besides them, their flocks were in constant danger from animal predators like lions, bears, wolves, and even human predators like sheep stealing thieves. Shepherds were among the poorest of the poor. It's interesting that in John chapter 10, Jesus chooses to put himself in the shepherding role to describe his relationship to his followers. In doing so, he placed himself firmly in the prophetic tradition of Ezekiel 34, which describes God as the good shepherd who cares for his sheep. By calling himself the good shepherd, Jesus identifies himself as fulfilling his role and the promises of God. Back up a bit to verses one through 10 though, and you see that Jesus 
is setting up a contrast between the shepherd who cares for his flock and the thieves and bandits who come only to steal and kill and destroy. The Pharisees may have seen themselves as the benevolent bosses of the people, but Jesus makes it quite clear that their oppressive religious posturing was bringing the people nothing but misery. They were clueless managers who just didn't get it. Jesus, on the other hand, understood the needs of his flock, and he invested in bringing abundant life to those for whom he cared. Here then is the second set of threes which correspond to Lencioni's indicators of job misery and which can lead us to abundant living. First, Rather than anonymity, being known is essential for abundant living. No anonymity here. The abundant life has everything to do with the relationship of the shepherd to the sheep. For Jesus, the first and foremost sign of the abundant life had to do with knowing and being known. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, says Jesus of the shepherd, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. If a basic human need is to be valued by someone in authority, Jesus is all over this. We don't serve a dispassionate, disconnected God who sits in a divine office dispensing orders. In Christ, God knows us by name and values and cares for each of us. In a world where people find themselves wanting more of something or someone, Jesus offers an abundance of love, grace, and hope. Moreover, the church has always recognized the value of being known not only by God in Jesus Christ, but by each other. So the church has always put an emphasis on hospitality and community. Church is to be a cheery place where many people know your name at least enough people to satisfy the human need for being known. Second, rather than irrelevance, relevance to life is essential to abundant living. The love of God in Christ is not just a sentimental thought. Jesus would lay down his life and be the gate through whom all of his sheep, his people, would come in and be saved. The love and care of the Good Shepherd has a very definite purpose. We are people who can make a difference, just like Jesus did as a shepherd. We are not just saved from the dangers of being apart from God. We are also saved for the mission of sharing the abundant love of God with others. Jesus came to bring us abundant life and says to us, As the Father sent me, so I send you. In God's plan for abundance, our relevance in the world isn't based on our job title, on what we produce, or on how much we make. No one gets out of bed in the morning to program software or assemble furniture or do whatever it is that accountants do, says Lencioni. They get out of bed to live their lives, and their work tasks are merely part of their lives. An abundant life embraces a much larger vision of what life is meant to be and how God calls each of us to a particular purpose and ministry in this world. As Paul put it, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. No matter in what job, family, or life situation we find ourselves, we find relevance when we see our connectedness to the purposes of God for the whole world. Third, rather than fuzzy measurement or immeasurement, ministry is the key, not measurement. At the end of his book, Lencioni encourages his readers to engage in what he calls the ministry of management. I have come to the realization, he says, that all managers can and really should view their work as a ministry, a service to others. Whether we manage workers or just our own lives, viewing our work as ministry is a step toward understanding our relevance in God's eyes. Measuring the abundant life 
involves a different kind of math than the rest of the world uses. All the things that typically mark success in the world don't add up to a hill of beans in the eyes of Jesus. The abundant life in Christ is always outwardly focused, always concerned about how much one gives rather than one gets. If there's a measuring stick for the followers of Jesus, then it has to be Jesus himself. We measure ourselves by asking, how well did I represent Jesus today? How did I reflect his presence in my life? Did I move the kingdom of heaven a little closer to earth today? Being a disciple of Jesus Christ may be a tough job, but it's certainly not a miserable one. After all, we serve a divine manager, a shepherd who loves us enough to die for us, one who gives us abundant lives designed to be truly lived with and for him. May God lead us to discover how to live out our God-given purpose, and may our lives be witness to the wonder of all God's gifts. Amen. This morning, as it is our custom on first Sundays of each month, we gather remotely in order to keep us all healthy and safe. But God is ever with us, and we can make our online worship services interactive celebrations to allow us to worship Almighty God. We're so glad that you are joining us as I lead us through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and I hope that you will actively participate in sharing the elements of bread and juice that we might be strengthened by them. If you have not previously prepared some bread and juice or wine as elements for this sacrament, then I would suggest that you pause the video momentarily and retrieve the elements that we might all commune together. Let the bread be something for yourself, or some bread for you and others in your home, and prepare a cup or cups of juice as you prefer. Set these elements wherever you are worshiping with your faith community. You might want to consider lighting a candle or have a photograph of someone that you wish to bring into this circle of faith beside the bread and cup. Thank you for your preparation. If some of you are just now joining us for the sacrament, don't worry about the type of bread or juice that you have. God knows that your intent is to commune with God and one another. As we gather today, Lend Christ your table, your bread, your cup, and your heart, for it God desires to draw close to each of us. We are one bread, one body, one cup of blessing. Though we are many throughout the earth, and this church family is scattered today, we are one in Christ. Wherever you are, rest your hands upon these elements of bread and juice, which we set aside today to be sacramental. Let us ask God's blessing upon him. Gentle Redeemer, there is no lockdown on your blessing and no quarantine on your grace. Send your spirit of life and love to us this day, along with your blessing upon every table where your children shelter in place, that this bread may be broken in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live and breathe in us that we may honor you with our lives. We remember that Paul the Apostle wrote letters to congregations throughout places that we now call Greece, Turkey, and Macedonia, and they were the first remote worship resources. Our online service actually has a long heritage. The communion words sent to the church at Corinth were these, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, 
saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. We are, we are one, one in Christ, in, Christ in, in the bread, bread we share. share. The body of Christ broken for each of you. Let us eat of it. Let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We are, we are one in Christ, Christ in, in the, the cup, cup we share. share. Let us pray. In thanksgiving for this meal of grace, O God, we come rejoicing that the very method of our worship, we have embodied in it the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands, nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows as free as the Spirit in all places. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all those bodies, spirits, and hearts that need healing. And let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. Amen. It's now time that we join together in the prayers of the people, and our tradition here at New Covenant Church is to start that by singing the Cares Course. Please join us. triumphal entry, the Last Supper, arrest, betrayal, trial, and his crucifixion. How brief was his life and how fast his fall. How faithless were his friends and how faithful his foes. And then we remember that we are his disciples. He is our master and leader, our teacher and friend. We are sinners and he is our savior. And we realize that we would have betrayed him as well. His speech was straightforward, and yet he was condemned by lies. His intent was to be faithful, yet he was accused of treachery. His life was pure, and yet he died a criminal's death. O oh God, you command us to follow in his steps. You say his wounds have healed us. O shepherd and guardian of our souls, though the way be difficult, we believe. And the spirit of those who looked for you in the empty tomb, we believe. And the spirit of those who stood before you in the upper room, we believe. And in the spirit of those who walked with you on the road to Emmaus, and those who broke bread with you on that morning by the sea, we believe. Lamb of God, 
Lend us your presence now, that we might see your will and have the strength to follow where you lead. You are our shepherd, and we hear your voice. We will follow, knowing that where you lead us, you will be with us, and you will care for our every need. Be our vision, our wisdom, and our guide, for you know the purpose for which you created us. God of love, we come in prayer for those who need you in a special way. There are many among us and our acquaintances and extended families who suffer a variety of illnesses. We pray that they would be restored and renewed. You have the power to conquer death and we look to you for help. Remind us daily that nothing can remove us from your love and that no matter what our circumstances may be, your word to us is fear not. Use us to care for those in need and grant us all your peace. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are not gathered together in our sanctuary, and yet we encourage each of you to give generously of whatever you have, and we would greatly appreciate your support for our ministry. Our closing hymn now is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Please join us in singing. Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Jesus Christ is Lord.